So we're r- literally hours out from Abs Series 12, the Pro-Am. Yeah. This is uh, your return to the platform. First competition this year, and uh, you've been at pretty much everything handling-wise this year already. Yeah. But uh, how are we feeling? Uh, I feel pretty good, man. Um, yeah, weight seems to be pretty decent. Like, goal of this comp was to come in, like, literally, it was a project big and strong. Mm-hmm. Um, last comp in August was my return turn comp from the bicep tear and uh, surgery from that so I wasn't like at 100% going in I was I was still pretty decent I was strong mm-hmm. um, and I thought I was on for a good day but I just kind of knew if I was going to be competitive at that I needed a big cut yeah. there was just no way around it I just didn't have my bench wasn't back fully I was like I didn't have like a deadlift bar to play with so I knew that was going to potentially cost me some kilos there mm-hmm. so I was like I'm going to have to make up the points in some other way and it was just one of those comps where, like, I'm relatively okay with my performance at it, but not entirely satisfied. I'm like, I for didn't, sure. I didn't go out on my best merit there. So, I said, I ended up signing up for eleven, like immediately afterwards. Mm-hmm. Bad idea. Just should. I was so burned out, dude. Like, I just come back from six months of traveling, mm. threw myself into this prep, uh, fully committed to it. Had a baby in the middle of it. Um, you know, all really great things, but at no point did I take a moment to try and chill out and decompress. Mm. So. I was like, I started, I started prepping for 11. I was just like, this isn't going to work. I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not in it. And then I was like, I got a call that I'd be returning to, to work where I, where I travel for work. And I knew that was going to be coming up sometime in April. So I was like, this is going to be my only opportunity to compete this year. So if I'm going to do it, I need to sign up for this one. And like, I, I didn't like put myself under the same amount of pressure for the prep. I kind of knew, I just wanted to go out and have a good day, um, try and break that 500 dot margin that I've been chasing for a couple of years. Yeah, you're really and within striking distance. Huh? Really, really within striking distance. Like literally one attempt away, you know? Um, and I wanted to break an 800 total. That's That's been the goal for like the last, for the last while. So I was like, if I'm going to do it, I have to do it here. Um, didn't want to put myself under any big pressure. I knew I had the commitment of opening up the new gym in the meantime and I was going to be very hands-on with that project. So I was like, all right, let's not, try and have any crazy weight cuts. Let's go for the cheat code and gain a bunch of weight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you've got, you've definitely like, even the couple of minutes you're here, you're talking, you've got your fingers in all these pies. You're, yeah. There's so many moving parts, so many things you're tied into. So to be able to perform at this level and still, you even just mentioned, not only do you run your own business, you've literally recently moved premises. I was, I witnessed you just taking all the equipment down. Yeah. You're very hands-on with that. And then the whole weekend and you were handling people at the Irish PF Open. So even during the prep into this meet ab series to have pro-am you've had a very very loaded schedule you're at nationals as well handling all your athletes so let me ask you this with the bicep tear previously i'm sure anyone that follows you on instagram has been following the story it's been well documented your comeback story on your youtube channel how are things looking with the bicep how is the body feeling coming into this one body feels good actually um i have a a little niggle here or there like yeah, nothing out of the ordinary, you know. Powerlifting peaks, you know. <laughs> Powerlifting peaks, man. You know, you just hope it doesn't come into play on the day. And does the body fully recover in time? You know, I I feel overall I feel good. Um, you know, the the last two three days have obviously been a little bit challenging with trying to get down a little bit of weight. Yeah, it was like one ten. I knew I needed to come in under one hundred five. Um, I didn't do anything too drastic. I knew a lot of that one ten was just going to be additional bloat. So I should lose a couple of kilos easy enough. You're still looking full. Like, you still look yeah, good. Yeah, still you know? full. I think I was like 105 point something this morning. So, man, you know. It's hot enough in here. You'll sweat a little bit out of you. Exactly, man. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not too stressed about it. I mean, I would really like to be just under the 105 mark. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. But, you know, I, I just would like to be under it, get a little bit of extra dots from it. Uh, but ultimately, this this comp is just about performing well um, and going out and saying, I can be really, really proud of that performance, that total. And listen, I think you're on for a great day. You mentioned last full meet was Abs Pro. Uh, that would have been the Abs Pro weekend in yeah. August last year, which is a much harsher set of conditions to lift in, in terms of the equipment used and the heat we had that day. I've talked to a couple of the guys about it who've been on, but uh, I think you're set for a savage one now, particularly because for anyone that doesn't know, you're a monster deadlifter. Like you are like let's let's not mince words. Here. Okay, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> Do you want to know actually a little funny story, right? So, in April 2021, I pulled my first 300 kilo deadlift, and at the time, in the under 105 category on the board, 
the top uh, the top deadlift was 302.5. Yeah. So I said it today, I said, could I match that at a lower weight and get on the board? And he's like, no, you have to pull more. So I was like, Grant, I'll pull 305. And then that August, you came in and pulled 320. 320, yeah. And I was like, well, at least we got an Ian on the board. <laughs> it just wasn't me. So you've created this massive gulf. And I was like, well, bollocks, you know? Yeah, I think that one, man, I remember Barry Pickett. That was the scalp. Yeah, yeah. That's I was right. like, Irish powerlifting gold. Yeah. If there was ever going to be a name I wanted to take off a board, it was that one. Yeah. Um, you know, all respect to Barry, super inspirational guy, and hopefully we see him return someday. Yeah. Trendsetter, but, like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Way ahead of his time, like, still has has this total that is just unfathomable. Yeah. I mean, world record and bench press and technical gold medal. And, you know, the guy is super inspirational. So to be able to take that particular name on my lift yeah. was, you know, that was a big, big moment for me. Um, yeah, sorry to do it to you. Ah, no, listen, man, do you know what, right? In in one way, as much as like I would have loved, even for like a blink of an eye, just to say it was my name up there, it's also massive to be able to see how the standard just keeps improving it's crazy, right? every year. It's crazy. Like you mentioned Barry Piggott. So the re Barry Piggott, for anyone listening, world-class powerlifter, doesn't currently compete. Same way we had Brown on Mac Peak for a while too with the like absolute goats of the early oh, days absolutely. of Irish powerlifting in the like mid 2010s, like 2015, maybe 2020. Um, but like the big thing about those is that I think those lifters were so far ahead of their time. Like I think if Barry were to come back now, I think he'd, a good few lifters would be giving him a good run, but I still think he'd be one of the best. But yeah. it's a it's great for me to see there's there's the likes of yourself. There's other guys that have come on the scene like Mark Stell, Kean Madden. There's all these phenomenal lifters. Danny. That, D damn me, man! Like, what the hell? Like, you know, what? A, what a savage! Who? Who then dethroned took, your? Oh yeah, took not, you off the board. Not only did he he he, he took it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that like that was a big thing. Anyone listening, I'm sure they're very familiar with. Uh, we had Irish PF Nationals, the 105 flight. I'm sure you got to see a good amount of it yourself. What a flight! Like, I actually, you can blame Jack Thornton for this. Um, I left during that. That was the flight I was looking forward to. Ah, and. Jack was originally supposed to be doing this comp. I was like, Jay asked, you know, which flight do you want to be in? You want to be in the flight with Jesse and Luke? Or you want to be in the flight with Jack Thornton and Noel Whelan? I was like, well, I mean, I'm not just going there to take part against Jesse and Luke. Mm. It's a great flight to be a part of. But if I can go head to head with Jack and Noel, big moment, that, that'd be a hell of a lot of fun for me. Mm. Um, so Jack puts up a couple of days out before nationals. Mm -hmm. 300 squat. Motherfucker. Yeah. I'm like, all right, looks like I won't be missing that session. And it just happened to be on the same time. I had the only time I could go between my lifters was during the 105s. Now I'd look at it in the live stream and go back and forth. Um, but yeah, I had to go. I had to go to abs, go over, get my session in. Because mm. th that's just the way it is. Um, you know, I would have loved to have been there to see it in person. I've seen all the videos. You know, yeah. I spoke to Ken afterwards. That was that was an incredible Flight, like powerlifting one that day. 100%. You know, that was that was an agree. incredible flight of powerlifting. Well, I, I put it to you this way, especially with your own story. Like, it's a, that's where, because you're wearing so many hats, fingers in so many pies, so many moving parts, you're handling, you're coaching, helping set, you brought equipment. You had to get your own training in somewhere. You've got a competition to prep yeah. for. So there's going to be sacrifices made somewhere. We were actually, so I'm, I was competing in the under 93s. We were in the same like session and it, like, there was myself, Keen Madden, Beck Phillips. I believe his name's Beck Phillips. Uh, he's a phenomenal guy as well. Real, real. Sli Have you met him before? I haven't met him. No. He's a guy from up north. He, I didn't know him too well prior to this, but like naturally, he came second in the under one, uh, under ninety three. Is Keen won naturally. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was third on the podium. We had a uh, Dustin De Perio and uh, Adam Joy in as well. Sav all savage lifters, but we were just like it was. We were to warm up for those boys. You know what I mean? We were literally just getting the bar warm for them. Like, and I was the opening act, yeah. Straight up, man. And it was like, it was some of the best seats in the house because we got to watch what they were doing in the back, but wild, wild. Yeah, sharing the back room with that. What, what an amazing energy that must have been. Mm. Like, that was, that well, was electric. This is why I'm really excited for your lifting now tomorrow because yeah. you are in there with, like, like, fair enough, you're sharing a flight with two absolute, like, Goliaths in Jesse Moore and, and Luke Tolman. But there's battles all the way down that roster. Mm -hmm. So I know a big one that's been talked about is Ian Benson versus Noel Whelan. Yeah. Which one of you guys is going to be the first to get the 500 dot score? I think that's going to be a great one to watch. Honestly, I mean, confidently, I want to tell you it's me. Mm. You know, but Noel's a phenomenal lifter. He is. Super, super experienced lifter. And we'll, you know, throw darts at each other back and forth here on social media for fun. But like... 
he's he's I, I hope he does it. You know, I hope I get one dot more. <laughs> you know, if anyone's going to break yeah. it first, it'll be him because he's got a way smaller deadlift than me. <laughs> so if he gets 500, it'll be on his third. <laughs> so um, for I, I would like to see Noel break it and we're going to push each other. And, you know, we've, we've talked back and forth a bit. Like, this is going to be like a long-term friendly rivalry. Great. You know, this this is, the, I think the sport needs more of it. Um, it's the same with me and Ken. We, we you know, have a little back and forth on social media from time to time. But, you know, it all very much comes from a fun place and, you know, it, it's a place to respect, but we ultimately want to push each other. Mm. You know, hopefully one day we can see Ken back, you know, we'll see what the what the landscape of Irish powerlifting looks like over the next couple of years. But hopefully me and Ken can have another head-to-head one day and, you know, I've spoken to him and like, all dots aside, I will totally you with this, I want another run. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the plan is I want to have a run at Ken again and, you know, I want to have another run with Noel. I'd love for the three of us to have that battle once again and mm-hmm. see who can come out. And, you know, Ken, if you're listening, if you're listening, I'll do it in sleeves. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> clip, clip that bit. We're putting that up. Well, do you know what? It, it, and you've mentioned having those rivalries really helps not only the lift, like, because that's it. It's all done in good sportsmanship. The idea is... As you're trying to egg each other on because it's that little bit of, yeah, we're all mates, but I want to lift you. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Where, where where it becomes really interesting with me and Noel is that it is dots. Yes. Who who plays the best? Like, who plays powerlifting the best on that day? Yes. You know, who makes the best attempt selections? Who is Who has the most at- successful attempt rate on the day? Mm. And that's that's the, the strategy end of the game, right? It's for me and Ken, we can come in, similar body weights, whatever. Who's going to be the strongest on the day? Me and Noel, it's a different game. It's a much more strategic. You know, it is a very strategic game. And I love strategic gameplay. I love that on the day. Um, same with the with the last comp at, at Series 10, you know, strategically not taking my second deadlift. Mm-hmm. I knew I didn't have much left in the tank after the opener. I was like, I'll just see what everything looks like afterwards. That was how I ended up pipping out Noel. Yeah. Because I saw what he had left after he took his second. I'm like, great. Now I've had an extra couple of minutes to recover. So I know what I need to take to get ahead of you on that. Ken had too much of a margin at that point. And I remember Joe Buckley came up and he was like, if you pull this, you could pull for first. I'm like, it ain't that wrong. Mm. It just, you know, sometimes you got to call a spade a spade. It's like, there's, now Ken's got that dog in him as we saw, right? 100%. And wow. I like to think yeah. that I, I can show some grit, but there's, you know, there's a point of reality where you have to be like. Yeah. That you know. guy has another level. Uh, man, like, just something like I'd never seen before. You know, that's, yeah. the, the guy is an incredible competitor. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he, and that's, that's one of those reasons why I try to just have that rivalry with him. It's mm-hmm. like, he pushes me to be better. Mm-hmm. Like everyone does. Jake Brennan's another one. Jake, I, I love the guy. Me and Jake get on really, really well, but there is a picture currently outside the steps of abs and it is the one where Jake drops a deadlift. Yeah. The person standing beside him in that picture is me. I was spotting and loading at that abs pro and I, I still I to this day own the rack and bar from that comp. Mm-hmm. That history. That for me was a, a pivotal turning point in I knew that this is where I wanted to be. I knew at that moment that I want to beat that guy. Mm. You know, I wanna like one day I want to go head to head with Jake and put him to it. Mm-hmm. You know? Um do, those guys drive me to want to be stronger. Because otherwise, what are we doing here? Yeah, you know my my long term ambitions in the sport are to eventually get a ten times body weight total. Part of the reason for the ninety kilo cut: can I be there? Mm-hmm. Can I do it? Chances are I'm never totaling a thousand at a hundred, but you know maybe in five six years you don't know if I stay injury free and mm. I'm clever with my training. Nine hundred at ninety might be a possibility one day. Mm. I don't know. I'm going to chase it. You know, you fetch what you run for. Well, man, I love it. Like that's your you're singing to, from the same hymn sheet as I would often preach. It's it's that it's. So much of what people don't do or can't do, a lot of it comes from self-doubt. And it def- I love to hear when somebody says, like, that is a, a monumental goal, not just yeah. for yourself, but in the whole landscape power that will put you in the top percentage of lifters in the country. And you're already at an elite level. Like, the guys you're talking about, attempt selections of competitions, like you're talking about missing your, like, skipping your second edit to be better recovered for your third. Like, that's high-stakes powerlifting. That's where, like... That's where the real differences are made. But yeah. the big piece I do really want to get into here with you, because you've mentioned it a couple of times, and I think it's actually a really, it's a good talking point. We talk about the rivalries. It brings people in. You mentioned when we were discussing show notes, what we're going to talk about, you mentioned you were a pro wrestling fan. Oh yeah, huge, so this, huge. This, WrestleMania weekend, baby. This speaks to me, man. <laughs> like, this, like this was this was my life for 10 years. I know. Like, so 
not only that, I want to know obviously about your, how you got into being a fan of pro wrestling and things like that, but like it's those elements. I think if we can bring that into powerlifting, like it doesn't yeah. have to be as as gimmicky. Like we don't need an Undertaker powerlifter, you know. Although you know <laughs> what I mean, I take it. But I think like in the way there was like people like Conor McGregor in the UFC and love him or hate him, he got eyes on the product. We have characters like Jesse Moore and like yourself. Like again, you're very well spoken. And I think if we platform more people who are willing to have this, you know, all in good form, but this dialogue that drives people, say, you know, I want to see what he does. Absolutely, I want to see. Like I'm excited to watch you and Noel go head to head tomorrow. Yeah, man, that's that's the fun stuff. Like that element of wrestling when Power Mania, like when Jay when Jay ran the the Power Mania Ab series. That was sick. I mean, I was traveling for it, so I couldn't be there. I would have been a part of that 100%. I mean, picking a wrestling entrance song. Yeah. Like, I was absolutely coming out to Batista's music for that. <laughs> like, Savage, yeah. like, that, I, I have that monolift at my gym. Yep. You know, that, that was, I was like, this is where it's at. Mm. This is for me. I'm like, yeah, let's make powerlifting entertaining. Yes. You know, it, it's really not, I was having this conversation uh, the other day with some of my newer lifters, some of the juniors who are like super driven to to get to the highest level of the IPF and, you know, compete internationally there. And that's that's our goal. But they're like, what's the story with the press conference? I don't get it. Mm. I'm like, we're trying to make this thing more spectator friendly. You know, we're trying to make it more of a spectacle. It's like, you, you compare like strongman to powerlifting. Mm-hmm. Powerlifting is way more spectator friendly. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It draws eyes in. Like he's pulling a truck. I can I can process what that means. That's huge. Yeah. But three hundred kilos, four hundred kilos to general population, they're like, oh, I, don't, I don't know the difference between three hundred kilos squat and four hundred. It's like, yeah. how many bags of turf is that? Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a. I think having like the series events, having a theme, mm-hmm. creating and generating more rivalries within that. Because you look at like. Irish PF powerlifting and you're like there's a handful of rivalries now but it's ultimately who's the top 93 mm-hmm. who's the top 83 you know it, no one's competing with Nam you're there to watch Nam yes. in 83s you know the 93s are going to be interesting but you're, you're ultimately assuming this is Keynes to win mm-hmm. 105 was probably the only dog fight in the whole thing correct yeah. you know um, who was the girl in the 63s or 69s Jordan Bright yes I mean phenomenal what an athlete to watch but for Sheffield was a really good example of how to make that element of powerlifting more interesting Mm -hmm. because you're watching a flight full of like and no disrespect to anybody but if you're not like at Nam's level you're you're there to take part on that day sure anything can happen but that's that's Nam's weight class Mm -hmm. and when he's there to compete, you're there to watch him. Same way you're there to watch Jack Kenny. Like yep. there's there's nobody gonna take that unless these guys drop the ball. Yeah. Right. Whereas you look at something like Sheffield and it's like, maybe that's the future of how to make it more spectator friendly. Like that is electric stuff. You know, whereas the ab series, you can have more internal rivalry. That is what I love about it. like that dots element. Another thing with it is the divisions. Yeah. Like when you have a regional level lifter, they may never get outside of being a regional level lifter in the Irish PF. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. But having the ab series there gives them something to go towards. Like, what is the next goal? Like I said earlier, you fetch what you run for. Mm. What, are you, what are you trying to fetch in the Irish PF if you're not going to get to nationals? And then what if you're just only getting to nationals? Like one of my big turning points when I decided I'm going to step away and switch sides was I was beating the shit out of myself mm-hmm. to make top seven to come sixth, fifth, seventh, maybe <laughs> like yeah. killing myself to get in there and just not having a good time. Like I was happy. I got to do a couple of national comps and you know, but at, at that point it was like, wh- where does it become fun yes. again? You know, it needed to be more fun again and you, I needed can, something to go for. You can see it though. It's like, this is kind of one of the things when it comes to, if we take even Ireland, right? So we've got the ab series and we've got the Irish PF, which is obviously a feeder into the International Powerlifting Federation. <laughs> The, both these things can exist. So yep. people like the much more, like Damien Nam, who you've mentioned, premier powerlifter, one of the, like he, what's he, top second or third dots in the country now? Yeah, like, tested and untested in sleeves. He is, he is basically the premier tested Irish powerlifter and there's no debate in that in terms of the, on the male side. So he is, a, it's a clinic. You go to see this guy, his execution is excellent. His setup is excellent. He's cool, calm, and collected. He, he actually competed at the Abs Pro last year he as did, well. Yeah. And he put on an absolute clinic. Like, there's no debate in that. But then we've got these, like, rogue element characters like Jake Brennan, Eamon Hartford. I actually think, like, somebody like Jack Kenny would be a great fit as well. But this mm-hmm. is it. It's, like, you can have that more 
the way it's presented, like at the international meets for the IPF, it's very, you can see they're, they're trying to get to the Olympics. They're trying to be an Olympic-like sport. Yeah. And then you've got something like the Ab Series, which is like going to the darts. You know what I mean? It's everyone's there and they're having a good time. I don't think anyone walks into an abs meet and says that was boring. And I won't be bad. I've been at IPF Opens and I have not enjoyed myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it definitely seems like people are there for their lifters and that's it. You know what I mean? And I get that. They're yeah. trying to qualify or whatever. Some people, it's their first meet, it's their mom and dad. They have no idea what's going on. They're just there to support. But I love what we're talking about here, that we can bring elements in from other sports, like pro, even like pro wrestling sports, entertainment, and we look at what makes people, like what makes people watch two lads fake fight on TV? Yeah. It's it's not the fact that it's what they're physically doing. I know people have all their WrestleMania moments, but it's the characters. Like John Cena is one of the biggest names in the world, not because he's the best wrestler, but because he people are bought into him. Roman yeah. Reigns is another big character. Now, back in the day, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin, everybody knows the They're rock. entertaining. Exactly. Yeah, but, the, but not only are they entertaining, it's like, what's your flavor? Yes. You know, there's a character out there for everyone. So you can take, you know, a really strong powerlifter and just not necessarily root for them because maybe you just don't vibe with them. And that's mm. fine. So who can you get behind? And then if you create those rivalries, it's like, I'm on team Ian or I'm on team Noel mm -hmm. you know having that stuff is super super fun like that makes it entertaining it's um, you know especially when, when you get out and you when me and Noel step out and he's got his camp of people and I have mine in the crowd and you're going to have people that are shouting that bit louder for Noel and when I come out to be shouting that bit louder for me like that that makes it fun you know I, I think just having that more WWE style rivalries make it fun. You don't have to be the number one guy mm. to make it interesting as fuck to watch. Yeah. So you, we, I know now growing up you're a big fan of pro wrestling, still a fan of pro wrestling, I Love assume. It, yeah. Is Do you think the reason you see this and the, the value in this is, I know you mentioned as well, you've like a, an acting background. Um, well, I don't have an acting background. I train some actors in so PT. Do yeah, you think being around, but like being around those people and that, what they, what their product is or who they sell is what the, the caricature they can adopt. Do you think you're kind of like, like there's that like, because you're with people that that's what they do, you can see the value in being able to, you know, transfer those skills to another medium like powerlifting. Yeah, 100%. I mean, a, a lot of it, when, when I'm around those those guys for work, it's, I watch them as they develop their characters. I, I love asking them questions about it. Like, like, what's in the script this season? You know, how does your character develop? How does your character change? How do they dress? What kind of words do they use? How would they say this particular line? Like, that character development of it makes it really, really fun and it's it's really, really interesting. And the the sport that we're in needs more personalities. And maybe it's just a persona they play for the sport, mm -hmm. but that makes it really, really interesting. Yes. You know, it's like, how are they gonna put this out? How are they gonna speak about this? Like I'm I'm like I can't wait for the press conference today. Like yeah. I'm just looking forward to seeing how everyone gets on. I wanna see how Luke and Jesse interact with one another. I wanna see how, you know, Dave Richardson and Jake go back and forth. Yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing if anyone tries to have a pop at Josh Edwards about, you know, bombing out last time. And yeah. you know, because he's again, for that top three, I can't see it not being Jesse, Luke, and Josh. Mm -hmm. If they all have good days. If they all have good days. If they all have good days. Anything can happen, right? But the press conference now makes it fun. It's like well, we're going to see what these guys have to say about each other. And if you can get behind, there's a backstory now. Yes. Like we're building a history of storytelling in the sport, just in our little pond of Irish powerlifting. Yeah. Like, honestly, man, I think the Ab Series is the greatest thing that's happened in Irish powerlifting ever. 100% agree. 100% agree because I think it's like anything. Like uh, people who are listening that are pro wrestling fans probably remember, and I'm sure you do too, back in the very early 2000s, uh, for a long time, we had the WWF, we had WCW, and then off to the side, like ECW. ECW, yeah. But then, this was like the peak, this was like the, be the Attitude Era. The Attitude you know? Era. So, uh, do you know the last guest I had on before, this was a, a mate of mine, Dean Merton, who's a pro wrestler, he's still a pro wrestler yeah. to this day, and we talked, we talked a good bit about it. I'd say you'll enjoy that episode when it's out. Uh, so, that was like the peak of pro wrestling. And then what naturally, as I'm sure most people know, the two other companies, WCW and ECW went out of business. They were bought it, bought out by the WWF, later renamed the WWE. And I think meant like as good as their product is, and their product makes more money now, it's more global. But I think in terms of their ability to tell stories and put on more cutting edge products for or put cutting edge a product for the time, 
I think that like that edge was take was blunted slightly because yeah. they didn't have competition. They didn't have another another company doing something different that just taught us something they didn't. Like every, I'm sure most people from the mid to late nineties, if we have listeners that are that yeah. old like us, <laughs> they might remember the NWO and then there was like D Generation X. You had the the it was the accumulation of all this raw talent. It was like the perfect storm, but because there was other there was another product out there trying these new ideas and then you could see the WWE or WWF at this time could see that you know it made them work harder think harder so I think the existence of the AB series makes like the Irish PF work harder I think internationally I know a lot of Americans and things like that all over Europe these other meets are like yeah. what are they doing that we're not doing you know what I mean like why why is it there's so many eyes are going on this product and what and again Jay trial and error things used to have a heavy metal band play whereas now we've got like the fire breeders and things like that yeah. so it's an ever evolving and growing thing and I think that's the thing about it it's still in its infancy and we're all here to see it so I'm yeah. like right now tomorrow we've got Ab Series 12 I'm excited to see what we're looking like but Ab Series 20 yeah Ab Series 20 man can you imagine I'm I'm here for it we, like I'm, given how frequently these things roll out I mean what's that three months from now <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that's like, do you know what is as well, right? It's, I'm always, I get it, but I'm always, so I competed at the first ever app series, right? And yeah. I bought my ticket like two months after they went on sale. Now you have to get them pronto, especially for like a division two lifter. It's, there's so many more people coming into this. I honestly think we're in the golden age of Irish powerlifting particularly. Absolutely. I think the amount of, uh, the ease of access, the opportunity, all the different powerlifting clubs popping up everywhere, I think is huge. And, I think it's something that if we're all smart, we can capitalize on and keep the ball rolling like this press conference. I would look at it in two ways and I definitely want to get your thoughts on it. One is the entertainment factor. It gets people a day before the meet even starts listening, paying attention. What are these guys saying to each other? Mm -hmm. Who's going head to head with who? Like after we do the ceremonial way and we'll probably do face-offs. I'm running all this. I'm master of ceremonies. I definitely want you to face off with Noel. A hundred percent. So then it's also right on a more, as much as this is the entertainment part also, Depending on how the press conference goes, and there's definitely, particularly in the clash, there's some delicate egos. I'm very curious is will some of the comments rattle or rile some of the lifters? Oh, I will, hope that, so. will that change game plans going into Saturday? That's so interesting to me. It could do, man, especially like, you know, in this untested side of powerlifting. Mm -hmm. You're not always the more fun side. You know, you're, but sometimes that's not, you're not always in your right frame of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, that that definitely plays a role in. Maybe someone's fuse is a bit shorter. Maybe they've been cutting weight and they're a bit tetchier. Mm. You know, it definitely adds some extra layers to the dynamic. Um, I think it's going to be really, really fun to sit back and witness it. And and you know what I love? I love that. So you take Jake. Yes. He will just tell you straight down the middle. Yeah. He doesn't give a fuck. That's what I love about him. And he's got whatever he has to say to you. And whatever he has to say about you, he's going to say it to your face. Yes. And he's going to say it there and some people are going to get a little bit riled up from it. It's just whether or not they're good enough with their words to come back quick. Mm -hmm. Are you witty enough for him? You know? Yeah. Are you going to come out of there fuming and bullying? You know? That, that's, and that's the thing. I think that's where, like, I love that Jesse-Jake rivalry in the series when it's for dots. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it goes without question that Jake is the guy. Yes. There's, there's not like, what are we debating? There's no debate. Like, dots, sure, cool. Mm. But, you know, Jake's the guy. Let's not, let's not deny it. He's the strongest. And that's why I like seeing the back and forth. Like, it doesn't knock a star out of Jake. He's like, okay, take your dots. That's cool. Where, yeah. where I'm going to compete, like, we don't, we don't compete for dots. Mm -hmm. And he, he just doesn't seem to knock a star out of his confidence. And, you know, then because Jesse gets that, well, I have the dots and the Wilkes, so what are we doing? You know, you're not the guy anymore, I'm him. It's, it's just watching the two of them go back and forth. It's, it's a hell of a lot of fun. It's just whether or not they rattle each other. Now, they're not going against each other, but I'm interested to see what Luke has to say, especially after Jesse's interview. That What an interview as well. Do you know, even when you mention it though, so I'm sure most people listen to them. I've had Jake on here twice. We've discussed Jesse more and at length. Jesse's somebody I'd love to speak to as well. But it's it's like back in the day in wrestling, you had like your, uh, you know, your your world champion and like the WWE champion yeah like the two different titles like Jake is claiming Ireland's strongest Jesse's claiming yeah. Ireland's strongest and I suppose it really does boil down to what you see as the bigger 
accomplishing the biggest total or the biggest dots and wilks. So I think that's that's what makes the, and they're both very good verbal combatants. Yeah, I think I think it it's it's very context dependent, right? So it's it's very circumstantial at the time. So it's like, well, for Ab series, yeah, we can all talk about our dots and you know Wilkes if he decides to run another Wilkes comp or whatever, right? And that's great, and it, it I think it makes it entertaining to see who can outplay the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's who wake cuts the best. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's other dynamics to it, but. I'm not really too worried about what my, like long term, this is still a strength sport and this is still about how much weight we can lift. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's always going to come down to the strongest lifts the most weight. That's just the way it is. I I like it from a competitive standpoint with, you know, I think it makes the dynamic of those competitions super interesting. You know, I love it for that reason. I love being able to get lifters motivated to to drive themselves on from division two to division one to one to getting into the pro and maybe the pro one day it gives people a long-term path mm. that is very very achievable for everyone like everyone can go from division two to division one not everyone is going to nationals mm-hmm. very true right so it gives everyone something to do it gives everyone a goal and i think with the overall in powerlifting though, like for me, like I told you, my long-term goal, my view on it is I want a 10 times body weight total. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't care what my dots is at that point. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a 10 times body weight total. You know, it's probably 990 is a more realistic goal um, than anything else because I'm only going to get so strong. Yeah. You know, but 990 is, is my long-term ambition in the sport. And that's going to be it for me. It's, it's for me, it's definitely a game of total. It's, that's just what it is. That's, that's, where the money's at, man. Yeah, for sure. People don't ask how much you, how many dots you have. They ask how much you bench press. Yeah, how much you benching? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I bench one forty, but I only weigh sixty kilos. <laughs> <laughs> Here, so let me. So you mentioned there, like bringing lifters through different divisions, creating creating these like opportunities for people to get into sport into the sport. This is something I think you have like mastered. Mm. So, your gym owner. Urban Barbell, previously Studio One, you've completely rebranded just to open your new facility. Yeah. I need I need as much as I'm interested in what you're doing now, I need to know a bit more of the story. So okay. firstly, how did you even start training? Okay. So how did I start training? Uh well I started training when I was a kid, like small, small kid, six, seven years old, mm. uh playing rugby. Fields boys. That was that was where where it came from. Um I was always like massively drawn to strength, muscles, being bigger, um, wrestling fan for my entire life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, seeing people be enormous was always very entertaining. We, I grew up in an era where Mike Tyson was the guy. Yeah. You know, and Mike Tyson's jacked. Yeah. You know, like seeing jacked dudes, that was just the era I grew up in. Yeah. So I played rugby for a long time, prop forward, you know, you don't choose being a prop, prop chooses you. Yep. <laughs> um, and coming from that background, it was always about, you know, you needed to have bigger shoulders. You needed to be more muscular. And even in Limerick, powerlifting's always been a thing. For as long as I can remember, Shane Brody, Dermak, yeah. these guys have been around. These are, you know, these guys were the, the trailblazers of Irish powerlifting for a long time. So I've always been exposed to strength sports in general mm-hmm. um, or, you know, just needing to be bigger and stronger. That brought me into fitness, the industry in general, like it, it kind of started that. It started from there. Played rugby for a long time. Um, kind of lost my way a little bit towards the end of secondary school. Met a girl, stopped playing, started drinking, you know, yeah. the, the usual stuff that most people end up not playing for anymore. And just kind of always missed it. Um, tried going back for a bit. Um, gained a huge amount of weight, like a huge amount of weight. When I say like I was, I was 130, 130 kilos you were 130 but, kilos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like wow. not like... Not a good 130. Not a good... I'll, I'll actually show you for reference to give you oh, an great. idea. For people listening, he's going to show me a picture on the phone. I need to see this. Do you know, but let, while you're digging at the picture as well, let me see. Oh, I have it ready for oh, you. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah, so that, that it was that kind of 130 kilos. Yeah, you're like, you look like a whole different person. Yeah, it, like it, it's shocking, right? So it was... I got to that place when I stopped playing. Right. Um, Because, you know, eating big was always a thing when you were a prop forward. Yeah, so do, do you think it's like, just just to, I don't want to like cut into the middle of the story, mm-hmm. but this is like such a common thing that happens to people. They're like young athletes and then they kind of hit their like early adult years, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22. And it seems to be particularly on 23, people like hit this hurdle and they fall. And it's, 
I'm always so curious as to what happens. You mentioned you lost your way. Was it just because you weren't playing anymore or was it that other things, you met a girl, you start socializing more, going out more, did those things kind of become more important, at least to you at the time, but you were keeping the plate spinning of, well, I still need to eat to be big? Um, well, I wasn't eating to be big. I was just eating because it was habitual at that point. Right. And then your your food behavior gets so out of whack. It's like, there was such a long time I could eat whatever I wanted and get away with it and because being big was the goal. Mm-hmm. I wasn't necessarily super strong, like powerlifting strong, but for when I was 15, I was probably the strongest 15 year old I knew. Right. You know, um, it was just one of those things where you just ate big foods. Like you have to eat steak, got to eat your shepherd's pie. You got to, you know, eat your spuds and eat. just being bigger and having a lot of food on board was just part of the game. The same way it is now, but yeah. it was just at that point, it wasn't even about education on it. It was just, that was just the way it was done. So loading up on past the night for a game. 130 kilos. What, what was the turning point? I got tagged in this photo. Um, so I, I, I was completely like unaware that that was how I looked. Um, I just thought I was me. Mm. So, you know, you get into photos and you know how you'll take like 20 of them or you'll get, you'll find the angle that you like the best before you post it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was doing the same thing even back then, you know, it was like, I would find an angle that I was, which one hides the double chin the most, which one, you know, can you not see my belly out? And if I fix my t-shirt this way and it wasn't until I got tagged in this photo that I had no control over going on the internet. Okay. I yeah. was doing this 5K run. Like I said, I came from a rugby background. It's not like I was totally unfit. Yeah. So we signed up for this run in Limerick and I was doing this 5K, tagged in this photo and I see myself and I'm like, who the fuck is that guy? And I'm like, that's me? Mm. Why didn't anyone tell me? And literally the next day, this is done. Like I said, always interested in strength sports, always interested in bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman, obsessed with them. Loved it growing up. Always a fan. Mm-hmm. Always read Flex Magazine, Men's Health. I was like, I know enough to know enough. You know, I know enough to get started here. So I went on a very stereotypical broad I had uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what a great book that, that was. Bible. <laughs> you know, and it's like, Sure, it goes into like, there's three body types, endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorph. And I'm like, oh, I'm clearly an endomorph according to this. Mm-hmm. This is my macro breakdown. This is the split. Like We're talking like 10, 12, 13 years ago where yeah. I'm like, I have a macro split of percentages of foods. Now, at that point, tracking wasn't really like a thing, but I was kind of one of the early adopters of it. I used it to my advantage. But the foods that I select were very bro. It was very chicken rice, broccoli, oats in the morning, egg whites, yeah. eating a handful of 10 almonds. <laughs> you know, That was my diet. I, I just, I became very focused on the goal. I'm a very goal-driven person. And at that point, when I knew I needed to turn it around, I was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, follow the road that all the greats followed and I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. every day before work and I'm going to do fasted cardio. I'm going to stick to these food sources. I'm going to track them down to a T. And within that first year, I went from 130 kilos down to 85. Wow. Um, yeah, like I said, I was committed to it. Like I remember going to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers in Croke Park and bringing my own chicken breast. <laughs> and my treat with that meal was I would go to Domino's and just buy the garlic dip. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So yeah, but yeah. For, for me, I became so locked in on it that it didn't yeah. matter. I, I didn't know another way at that point. I was like, this is this is the way that I'm going to do it. And it was sustainable for me to a degree and it got me to where I needed to get to. But that was how I ended up venturing down that road. I, I'd lost all the sweat and I was like, mm. I did it. Mm. I'm like, fuck, other people need to learn how to do this. So would you consider, would you say just based on that, because we were talking before we turned on the microphones and you were saying like one of the things you admired before you start working with Jay and one of the things that brought you into working with Abs and Jay Farrant was that he's got his military background, you've your sports, field sports background, yeah. you like the uniformity of it, you like the regimentation of it. So you think you would be quite a regimented person that if you have a goal, you'll take, you'll see the, you'll like look at the steps that are needed to get there and action each step along the way until the goal is achieved. Absolutely, yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm like. I Well, I'm, I'm a bit chaotic, um, so I would call myself chaotically organized. Um, I'm a bit of a free spirit, bit of a creative thinker. So mm. I can get a little bit like, sidetracked at times but there's always a goal that I'm working towards right um but I I have people around me now whose job it is to help me stay on one path mm-hmm. but generally yeah I'm very I'm very goal oriented I would be quite good when I'm regimented um 
in general, I try to just keep working towards the one thing. I'm never not working on the one path towards something. Uh, sometimes it might look a little bit like I'm everywhere, but I'm actually, you know, chaotically organized, like I said. It, well, the, the reason I ask is because in the, like, I've looked over the timeline of everything that's brought you from there to now. And the thing that stands out to you, it's actually something when I, was, I had Kim Murray on and we were talking and Kim is like this, super high achiever but I don't think she mm. sees it because she's doing it you know what I mean so she's yeah. only think well you know I sat in Domino's and watched I sat in my bed and ate a Domino's and watched a movie last night so obviously I could be could be grinding harder but like I look at it like this like you were so as you mentioned you lost your way a little bit but you set your sights on a goal and you went from 130 kilos all the way down to 85 kilos yeah. you opened your own business which to me is huge because most people are just happy enough showing up getting their pay at the end of the month, do, not worrying about their taxes or anything like that, but you opened your own pet shop. Yeah, yeah, just right up the pet shop, yeah. So how did, we, how did we get from being a guy that went, cut down to 85 kilos, you know, chicken at Red Hot Chili Peppers, <laughs> to I'm going to open my own business? What happened there? So, all right, so I'd lost the weight. Um, at the time, I'm, we were just coming, like th we were in the midst of the recession. Yes. Right. So as we're, as, as I'm working through it, there isn't a whole pile of working out. Like I failed my leaving cert. I had tried some stuff at college, um, had some like personal anxiety issues. I, I started getting like social anxiety going in there, dropped out twice mm -hmm. from, from, you know, third level education. And I was like, I need a job. The only jobs that were really around at this time were things like buying and selling gold. So that's what I ended up doing. I ended up buying and selling gold, like cash for gold. I ended up having that job for a while. And that was while I was dropping all this weight. So I was traveling a lot with that up and down the country every day. And when I had dropped all this weight, I'm like, I'm going to go back to college on a part-time basis. I, fo I found my thing now. Good. Yeah. Um, so I qualify um, as a PT. I, mean, I spent two years doing that. And at the end of that, I had started taking some clients here and there in this small little office room. Um, but I still needed a job. An opportunity came up along the way. This cash revolt thing was now starting to... Bomb disappear out, yeah, starting yeah. to bomb out excuse me so as that's happening I'm taking a couple of clients here and there but then I get an opportunity with a little bit of backstory um, so my ex and I we were together for like 15 years but at one point she had to leave her job she had a back problem she had to leave her job leave her office job and decided that she wanted to start selling pet products because of this we had we had this little West Island Terrier. My aunt sent over this product from Australia, which was an Addy Dog hoodie, this little grey hoodie for dogs. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's not like these usual, like, really gammy, cringy things yeah. that you put on dogs. Like, these dresses for dogs. It was like a cool hoodie. I was like, Addy Dog, class. So that was kind of the inspiration behind it, where she was like, well, I'm not working. I want to do market stalls. So I was like, I'll help. Yeah. So we started buying in products from China, and we met a supplier that was based out of I think it was either Kildare or Dublin, somewhere up here. Um, this particular supplier ended up coming back to us a couple months later and we're like, we're actually after acquiring this pet store in Limerick. Um, we're not based down here. We need someone to run it. Are you interested? Mm. And I was like, I'll do it. Sure. I'll come in, I'll manage it. We have our own products and we supply some products to you that we have bought from you in the past and that we have from China. Like, yeah, great. So that's how I ended up. I ended up managing that store. And then while being the manager of that store, I ended up, opening Studio One Fitness. I actually got into business with my mother. I really don't recommend anybody gets into business with their family. Um, this is a story for another podcast, but um, ended up getting into business with my mother on that. And we, my, my, my mother is like super into her fitness. She's working machine story at the moment. She's Excellent. pursuing a bodybuilding mm -hmm. career at the moment um, on the side. So that's, that's kind of her ambition. So I, I very much get my drive from her. Um, but we ended up going into that venture, decided part ways. I was more or less the, the front of the business and running it. So mm -hmm. just, it wasn't working out. The dynamic wasn't working for multiple reasons. Yeah, we don't of course. Family. Yeah. So I ended up um, looking after it entirely and I was completely swamped with my commitment to that. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Like, loved it. I was like, this is the thing I want to do. I'm running spin classes like four or five times a day. I'm taking like, it was a ladies only strength classes and I'm loving life at this point doing it. But the other guys that I'm running this business for are like, you know, you're starting to bring other people into, we want, kind of want you there. And I'm like, well, I've kind of committed, like I love this business as well. Mm. I don't really want to give it up. So I was like, what if I just buy it? So I just went to the bank, took out a loan, they agreed to sell it to me. I bought it for the cost of the stock that was on the shelves. And it was an okay deal for a while. Um, so that's how I ended up with the with the pet store. Um, 
yeah, I just ended up managing it for a bit while I was kind of starting to get this gym up and going. And then I ended up buying it out because I didn't want to give it up. Mm. Um, I don't have it anymore. I decided to close it during COVID and parted ways with that. So um, you've since doubled down that one. <clears throat> oh, yeah. When when COVID happened, um, obviously all the gyms across the country had to close. Yeah. Our lease was up anyway. So the timing was working out quite well. And I wanted to grow the business further, but I wanted to get further and further into strength training and powerlifting. I'd stopped taking the spin classes at this point. Mm. The, like Honestly, for a small business, trying to repair spin bikes is fucking expensive. Yes. These things, like we had the Star Trek spinners, the spinner NXT bikes. Uh, for anyone familiar with spin, we'll know what those are. If you're not, they're like a commercial end spin bike. But when they break, there's yeah. only a handful of people know how to fix them. And sometimes the parts don't come in on time. For every bike I was down, I was down money. Mm. Not only the money trying to fix the bike or replace it, I was down money on a bum on a seat. Yes. Do you know, actually, yeah. just, just while you're there, I remember, I, rem- I remember following Studio One back when it was Studio One. Yeah. And there's like, I can't remember if it's on your page or it was on that page, but I have like this very distinct memory of you on a spin bike. Yeah. I'm like, look at this big motherfucker up on this bike, you know, because I taught spin for six years in Flyfit. Yeah. So like, I, I could like, you know, sympathize with what you were doing. Yeah. yeah, you know, but I was like, look at this fucking big, strong motherfucker sitting on this bike. I was like, yeah. and we'd all complain about it in Flyfit, like, you know, but I just, I, I just wanted to say, I've got that memory, but I remember when you re branded mm-hmm. i remember even just aesthetically the difference i was like wow that yeah. pops way better you know studio one just looked like uh we're like a, a fitness club General that fitness studio, has yeah. a little powerlift inside yeah you know so was that what you, you've probably got this higher resolution viewpoint of this is who i'm appealing to this is my market as i mentioned to you before we start recording dan brought me through this process dan here in primal brought me through this process to really help me identify who am i talking to when i record one of these fucking sessions yeah. so you obviously identified who you wanted to speak to and who you wanted to work with yeah well what had for me uh, even though i loved the business element and i enjoyed spin to a degree it just wasn't it wasn't soothing my soul anymore so i i ended up going to um an irish muscle power expo in belfast mm. years ago we're talking like seven eight years ago and I'm like, I'm training, but for what? I'm kind of doing some squats and doing some deadlifts here and there. I'm doing some bro stuff. I'm doing these spin classes. I'm like, I'm teaching these strength training classes. And I'm like, what do I want to do? Like, I need something to train for. I, like, I'm, like I told you, I'm a goal-oriented person. I need mm-hmm. something to train for. So what am I going to do? I'm like, I don't have time to go back to rugby. As much as I want to test out this new 85 kilo frame. Mm-hmm. I don't have time for that. So I'm like, all right, I need to do something in-house here. Go to Irish Muscle Power. CrossFit's on. Strongman's on. Bodybuilding is on. Powerlifting is on. I go around to all these different ones and I'm just drawn to powerlifting. Like, I'm like, I just can't take my eyes off it. I keep going. Killian Carlin's competing at Battle of the Boyne is there. Right, okay. Um, this is how I met Killian. Yeah. So, I'm like, all right. I circled it again a couple of times and I keep coming back to this. Delroy McQueen was competing at this. Wow, you know? wow like okay. This is like way back. The, the OGs. Yeah, so I'm like, this is this is who I want to be. Mm. Um, so I actually ended up reaching out to Killian after that. Killian is my first ever coach um, in powerlifting. I thought he was way older than me. Killian has aged like bread. <laughs> <laughs> I can't so, wait for him to hear this. Yeah, yeah it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I reach out to Killian and that's my first venture into powerlifting. I'm going to sign yeah. up for this comp and I, I ask some of my clients who were training with me at the time, I'm like, you want to do it too? And they're like, sure. Um, so the the longer I'm at that and doing it, I'm like, this is like transforming my life all over again. I'm like, if only more people knew how empowering it is to just get stronger. It's not about the weight on the bar, but it's just mm-hmm. those incremental improvements. It's like, you can line up everything with it. It's, it just gives you this new perspective on things. I'm like, I want to get more people doing this. I want to help more people get stronger. And then that's when, as things progressed with Studio One and I'm growing the powerlifting team there, I'm like, I need a product that aligns more with who I am, with mm-hmm. who I want to be and the the business I want to have and the, the people I want to reach. Like, who am I trying to speak to? Like, it was such a conflicting, you know, message having Studio One Fitness, powerlifting team. Mm-hmm. It just, it never really, you know, it didn't mesh well. And it was, you know, people were trying to sign up and it's like, well, I don't want to do all that weight stuff. And I'm like, but if you just knew, if only you knew what it could do for you. Mm-hmm. 
So like the audience that we were drawing in was, you know, maybe women in their mid to late thirties. Um, not always, but you know, that, that was a big catchment of that area that we were in. And it was always like about, Hey, my daughter's communion is coming up in two weeks and I need to lose 14 pounds. Mm-hmm. It's like, cool. You ever tried a barbell? You know, you're trying to get people into it. It's like, it's just not the right audience and we're not giving off the right messages. Our, our image just didn't align with who we wanted to be. Mm-hmm. COVID happened, we move. Um, I take the, over the old premises that the pet shop was in. That's That was the final nail in the coffin for the pet store. Right. I was like, it's time for me to step away from that. I'm I'm no longer invested in it. Um, you know, it was me and my ex had it together and she stepped away from the business when we, when we split up. And... I was just like no longer emotionally invested in that business. It was just becoming more of a burden than anything. Right. And I was like, you know, I'm happy to close that chapter and move forward. We move in, we start doing up the premises and then the rebranding part actually came by complete chance. So inside in there, there's these girders up and I'm like, we're going to paint the place. The place is like green from the branding of the pet store. I'm like, we're just going to go with our branding for Studio One was this kind of like dark navy and yellow, almost like Wolverine's costume. Yeah. Right. I'm like, where are we going to, I'm not going to go with the navy because I want to just save some money because no one's making money right now in COVID. So I'm like, let's just go with like all black weather shield paint. It's going to be cheaper than getting this blue paint. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing that. And I'm like, I said, damn inside. I'm like, where will I put the yellow? She's like, I don't know if we really want to do the yellow. I'm like, well, we could do these girders yellow. She's like, yeah, can I be honest? I'm like, what? I'm kind of over the yellow. I'm like, well, look, if we're going to get rid of the yellow, I'm going to change the whole brand. She's like, to what? I'm like, I don't know, something cool. Mm. Like, she's like, yeah, yeah, cool. I said, no, for real. I was like, something cooler. Like, what about Urban Barbell? Boom. Yeah. And that was a, like, the penny just dropped on the spot. I was like, yeah, I have it. I went home like an hour later like roughed up a draft of a logo, got onto Fiverr, sent it off. I was like, okay, I think I think I know what we need to do now. Mm. And that was, you know, that was the beginning of that. You know, it was just by chance, it just happened to be this one penny drop moment from a conversation. And I was like, okay, this, Man, is, this is who we are. I, I love, I love the name Urban Barbell. Yeah. I think it's Sam, fucking cool. It's, like. it's, I think it just, it totally aligned with who I am, you know, my background, what I wanted to do, it aligned with with getting stronger. I just, because not everyone that joins is going to be a powerlifter. Mm. So I didn't want to give it like, just call it urban powerlifting. Yeah. I, I wanted it to be, this is this is a barbell club. This is a place you come to get stronger. Like, you know, when you come in here, this is about getting stronger. Mm-hmm. That's that's who it's for. It's it's for people that want to improve their life through the power of a barbell. Yeah. You and know? you know, you mentioned it there a lot of times. Like it was, you obviously gained so much from this. You're like, I'd love to create an, a, a space where other people can yeah. do this. And I completely, I, that totally resonates with exactly how I got into doing this coaching myself. It's particularly when you get people that are like, oh, you know, I want to look a certain way. It's like, if we take the focus strictly off how you look for a little while and focus on performance, you may find in that process that you start to achieve those aesthetic goals as well. Right, like, it's my product. Exactly. And it's, a couple of the, like, uh, one of the girls I trained actually Noel Whelan's sister, yeah. younger sister, uh, Katrina Whelan. Uh, she has gotten in the best shape of her life over the past year, all while focusing on powerlifting. And she's a gem. She's a lovely girl. But um, she uh, she said that to me. She's like, I'm, I'm actually, look, she's leaner. She's lighter. She's moving better. She's stronger, more energy. And it's it's part of what I love. about. I love when they have that light bulb moment. Yeah. But just, you have created that opportunity. Like, I know for, for many people, we talked previously, uh, I want to talk a bit about the Benton's Bitches. Oh, yeah. The, so yeah, the controversial they, name. I didn't come up with that name, by the way. I would they, never say something like they, that. They dubbed themselves <laughs> they, this. They, they dubbed themselves that, yeah. But you have this, like, cohort of lifters that are, like anyone I've ever spoken to about you as their coach, both currently or formally, I have never, like such universal love and acclaim. And it's not even like, oh, he's just a genius in programming. It's like, Ian just gets me. So, Darren Clark. Darren, yeah. Darren Clark? Yeah, Darren Clark, yeah. Because then there's also Katie, Katie Clark. Clark. Yeah. Uh, Lauren Mullane. Lauren Milan. Uh, yeah. Milan, sorry, my, my apologies. Uh, you have Tracy Kelly. Tracy Kelly. And then formerly Jane Jones, who Jane Jones, yeah. on her previous appearance was very complimentary Jane, yeah. for your period of time together. Ooh. And uh, the, the what you dubbed as people's powerlifting dad. That was the name. Yeah. So did was this just happenstance you became this guy for these people? Or was it just, was is it your 
coaching approach because it's naturally quite different to like I, I mentioned beforehand. Jay, the one reason Kim jo- Kim Kim Jones, you say Kim Murray loves working with Jay is she's very much give me a kick up the hole, tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Yeah. Right? But some people, a lot of it's I think a lot of it's like self belief. They like they're like you know I can't do this, and sometimes it's it's getting on the phone with them and saying. Let's talk through what you've done, where you've been, what you've overcome, all the work you've put in. You're way more capable than you're letting yourself be at the moment or you're thinking you can be. And from I know that was one of the things Darren said to me when we were talking at Nationals, is that you were you would always be the guy who would like hop on the phone for an hour or just talk them through things. Jane mentioned that whenever she's like traveling every now and then, you'll touch base, like, how are things going? How are you? And like those little things mean so much to people. So uh, it was, I think it's, that's one of the ma- one of the massive motivators. And I was like, I need to get Ian Benson on here. I need to know about this, more about this. Because as, you know, you're a super strong dude, one of the best powerlifters in the country. People are going to see this tomorrow. Um, but I have this, there's this expression that I heard years ago. Yeah, a, a coach in the States, Eric Cressy said, it's like somebody could work with you for a couple of months, you could put 30 kilos on their deadlift, but you're for an asshole, I'll say, yeah, he's an asshole. Whereas you could have made no major tangible change to their training, but if they loved every minute of work, which would go, that was a fucking great guy. So being a combination of two things is obviously best. Yeah. You've obviously embodied that. I think with me, um, the approach I take with coach, I, I would label myself as like a feel coach. Um, I very much like to invest in the individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and it only works when I can invest in them as a person. I I, I, I show this huge amount of empathy um, and belief towards the individuals I work with, regardless of what their goal is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's maybe with certain individuals what seems to work really well for me. Um, with, you know, with everyone, it's about managing their expectations. But if they believe they can do something, then who am I to tell them they can't? Mm. I might let them know what's realistic in the next 12 months. But if someone's ambition is to go on to become an international lifter, my job is to help them find a path. Mm. And this sport is something that you would question yourself in time and time again. Mm. A bad training session can make you feel like you just wasted a whole month from one lift. One bad rep changes your whole mindset on how a training block went. My responsibility to those individuals is to hop on the phone to them and say, hey, What about all these great things we just did for the last six weeks? Like, that's not gone. Mm. You had one bad session, one misgroof, one shitty night's sleep. You can't just allow yourself to doubt anymore. Like, I am their biggest cheerleader. No one wants to see them do better than me. Mm. And that's, and it's the truth, you know? And I think that's just what, it's just this, it's not that I have this tactic or this, you know, method it's just who i am and if the chemistry is there with the individual i'm going to give them 110 percent every single time like i'm always going to be there for them i'm going to be you know i'm going to stand by their side i'm going to give them a hug when they need it i'm going to be a shoulder they can cry on and an ear they can scream into mm. you know at, at no point am i ever going to turn my back on them i will always have their best interest first and that's something that I always drive home. Because sometimes you're you're sending out a program or whatever, right? And it's like, this is this is the outcome of the program. This is what we're hoping to achieve from this. Well, I don't know about this. Well, you know, what if we try this then? And, you know, you, you get into these conversations. And sometimes you have to be on the phone because a, a text just sometimes isn't enough. You, there's so much context missing. There's so much tone missing. Mm-hmm. Like, tone is so important. 100%. And I think that's the approach that I'll always take with it. I just, I need them to hear the sincerity in my voice. I need them I need them to understand that we're doing this to help you get better. Mm. And when you're having a bad day or a bad session or a bad thing in life comes up, that's okay. And let's say you can't string together six weeks of good training. I will I will try to reassure you that that's okay. So yeah, that's where that I'm I'm your powerlifting dad comes from. It's mm. like like I want to see you win. I want to see you achieve your goals and it fills me with nothing but pride to see that happen. You know, it's like that's all I want to see from those people. Like they, they've entrusted me to help them get to where they want to go. And that's my responsibility to them. And I, you know, I do not take that for granted for one moment. And I'm aware of the impact that a coaching relationship can have on an athlete. Mm. You know, I have a responsibility to those people to help them, mm. you know, and that's, that's what they've asked me to do. And I'm like, okay, that's what I'll do. When Dieran came on board, it was like, this is what I want to do. And, you know, you can have many ups and downs throughout those blocks. It's like, Stop selling yourself short. Mm. 
And if you won't believe in you, then I'll do it for you. You know, working with Jane, like Jane's an incredible person, incredible lifter. Like, honestly, I've never seen anybody as driven as us. Like yeah. such, such a Such a hard worker. My God, like, like inspiringly mm. driven. You know, I'm like, and the the relationship that I had with Jane, again, was just very, very, we, were, we became very close. And that was my job was to help look after her. You know, it was to help guide her in the right direction. And she got the internship with the strength guys. And, you know, for me, that was a super moment of pride. Like, there's an impact that I've managed to have on someone that maybe led to inspiring them to become a, a coach themselves. Mm -hmm. They want to do more, be more. And I got to be a part of that story for them. Yeah. You know, that for me is is huge. You know, like, I got to help Jane become 63 kilo junior national champion. Mm -hmm. Helped her get towards her first two international caps. Like those, those are huge moments, you know, to see someone set out these goals and be like, this is what I want to do. And honestly, she fucking did it. Yes. Because she's that driven, you know. The, the, the programming is fine as long as, you know, you have some basic idea of what you're trying to achieve from it. That'll kind of look after itself. Yeah. My job is sometimes to help point you back in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I try to do with them. You know, just just those people that I work with, they inspire me. And they drive me to be better. They challenge me to be better, mm -hmm. you know. And I try to give them the best of everything that I can, whether that's making sure that they get a time, you know, to have a chat on the phone, whether that means giving up time out of my day to get to know them, or whether that means I send them a pair of squat shoes because they need to try some out or mm -hmm. they need an extra pair of wrist straps or need me to bring headphones to a comp. Yeah, Whatever they need, I'm in their corner because my only goal is to help them achieve what they've set out to do. Yeah, and it, you know, it's having somebody there that they know that they can lean on and you're going to, you will take it, you're fine, you, you'll you absorb it all. I know there's a post, I can't remember what, I think it might have been prior to that, maybe coming into nationals. Lauren posted like a little collage of the yeah. two of you and it was her saying like, you know, you were there for all the, like the, the cheers, the high fives, her shouting at you, crying. Yeah calling you up at all hours and same with Darren. Darren mentioned, you know, she'd be ringing you at all hours of the morning just because sometimes people just need that person and it's, I really, like, uh, I have massive respect for that because there's not a lot of coaches that are willing to be that person. A lot of coaches, that is their job. I send you out your program, I check in with you once a week and I don't want to hear from you the rest of the time but you're obviously the guy who's willing to put this massive amount of time investment in these people. And like I mentioned, Jane spoke very highly on the podcast. Didn't need to mention anything about her performances. Just talked about how great you made her feel. And I think you're right. You got to play a part in helping her become everything she's becoming and become. She's achieved so much in Absolutely. her time in the sport. Like So uh, like kudos to you for that because that is, you, when you said you wanted to set out to get more people into this to show them how cool it is and how strong they can be, yep. you're, you're living that now. Yeah, yeah, man, I, I, I'm living my dream every day. Mm. Like, I wake up with nothing but, you know, feeling grateful for everything that I get to do. Mm. Like, my bad days are good days. Yeah. You know, like, when I'm under pressure or stressed out, that this is privileged stress yeah. and pressure. Because like, just on that, because I wanted I, I wanted to bring, I actually wanted to bring it up when you were bringing me through a little bit more of your timeline with the business, but I know you mentioned before, when you were going through a, a, a breakup before, that you had to sleep on the floor of your business. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, a little bit of background to it. So I met a girl when I was 15. Mm. Um, fell madly head over heels in love with her. Uh, girl goes to my Debs, my high school sweetheart. We get married. Um, we get married. We have a beautiful baby boy. His name is Jamie, just turned five. And the relationship had kind of just run its course. So we part ways. Um, we were together 15 years. The person I was and the person she was at 30 was completely different to the two 15-year-olds I fell in love. Mm. They, we just, you know, obviously there's many layers to it, but it run its course. We part ways. In that time frame, you know, she stays at the house. She's got our son. And I go and I have nowhere to go, basically. I'm, I'm not, like I said, business with your family is complicated. At this point, I'm not on great terms with my own parents. So um, I have nowhere to go. So... But I got this gym. I better fucking sleep there. Mm. And the, yeah, I spent I spent like six months there um, until, you know, two of my friends, you know, kind of scooped me up literally from the floor and are like, we're going to help dig you out. We're going to get an apartment together. Like I couldn't afford somewhere else. The, the business wasn't always great. Like business is hard, mm. especially like I said, with the business dynamic, I was, I was trying to like, 
pivot in towards this thing that I was super passionate about. And running spin classes just sometimes doesn't pay the bills. You know, it just doesn't do it. You need like, a vo- it's a volume game and you need money in the bank. And I wasn't a very experienced business person. I just really loved fitness. I just really loved the industry and I knew I wanted to help more people. So yeah, I, en- I ended up uh, living in that gym for six months. That was that was a dark time, but I think with that time frame, I kind of developed this new appreciation for powerlifting. Mm. Pa- powerlifting saved my life, like for real. I compete. Um, you look at my open powerlifting uh, profile. You'll see summer slam in that. I'm only just off the floor. Like wow, that's that okay. the, when I competed at summer slam. That's the timeline. I literally, my, because I'm a goal driven person, what kept me focused was powerlifting. Like having that goal to work towards, Mm. having other people to prep for those comps. Like this sport saved my life and changed my life in so many other ways, opened so many doors to me that like I'm forever in debt to it. Like I'm never leaving it. I'm never going anywhere. You know, I I owe everything to it. I'm like part of building this new urban barbell facility is to give back to the sport. I wanted a place for people to come and get stronger, That, but it, it's not just for my business or my club. This is open to everyone. Mm. If you're in the area and you want to come by, I've built this sick facility for you to come train in. Mm. Like, it was built with the purpose of hosting comps because I want to put on competitions and host comps that, you know, lifters deserve. Yes. Like, the sport deserves this. And I was in a position to be able to to do it. Like I got, I was fortunate enough that I could look at what Shane Brody did and Jermack did back in the early days. I got to look at what Jay has done and everything that he's achieved and moving gyms. I've got to see what City Gym have done with Gar. And I'm like, I bet you they would do something like this if they were starting again. Mm. You know, I just had the opportunity to start from fresh again. Yeah. And, you know, I was like, I got to learn from all of these people. So I was like, all right, this is what I want to do. Like, I wanted to be in a place where when you see the competition calendar come out every year and there's one being held in Urban Barrel, like, you're excited yes. to go to that one. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, fucking great. They've got hot water there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that. I want people to be excited to be like, yeah, I love the way it comes to run there. I love the equipment they have. I love the warm up room. I love the facilities. Like, mm. that's what I want. I want to have a place for powerlifting and I want to give back to the sport that's given me so much. Mm. Well, even look, that's so when you said, like, you know, working with the lifters you work with and the opportunities you create, and, you know, even if they're crying at you, shouting at you, it's like, wow, I've such a, like, life now is so good, particularly when you think about those yeah. dark days. And I think it's all these things are relative. Like, and I think that might be a contributing factor to what makes you as good at your job as you are is because you have brought yourself from being 130 kilos down to 85. You refound your passion for a sporting outlet after coming away from rugby. You found powerlifting and mm-hmm. you've you've doubled down and thrown so much into it. And you've, as you mentioned, you're wearing many different hats in it. Athlete, gym owner, coach, international coach. But not only that, there's this, like there's these core group of athletes that like I'm sure would say we, that we owe a lot to Ian Benson. And as you mentioned as well, you're, you had like the cur- the urban barbell you had was phenomenal, but like that you're like I can make this better. I yeah. can do one better. I know myself and the boys when we were visiting, you let us train. Thank you again for that. Anytime. And when you were walking us through and saying what was going to go here, what was going to go there, what was going upstairs, what we're going to do for the comps, if you can do even fifty percent of the things you mentioned, they are going to be some of the best competitions this country's ever seen, mm-hmm. bar none, bar none. I mean, include series in that. So I'm very excited for the future of Urban Barbell, but more so excited to see how you can continue to balance being the caliber of athlete you are to running your own business. We've mentioned you know, you've you've coached internationally. That's probably something you'll pursue again later on down the road, but let's just That's get right, Urban yeah. Barbell, the new Urban Barbell up and running full steam ahead. And if I'm not mistaken, you've just had another kid. Yeah, a little baby <laughs> girl, uh, Luna. Uh, she was born in July. Yeah, what an absolute dough she is. I'm crazy about her. Yeah, daddy's um, new girl. Huh? Yeah, daddy's a girl. She's she's amazing. The most placid baby. I I like all credit to her mom. Emma's done such a phenomenal job with her. Like has taken to motherhood in her stride. Mm. Like, like that. That's inspiring for me. Like, I know I'll do like all these things, and for me, it's just joining the dots to the next thing. So it always seems like a lot, but for me, it's just my day to day. Right. Like, honestly, it's the people around me that are my inspiration to do more. Like, I want to give them more. Like, Lauren's a great example of someone who will 
we will bicker back and forth. Like, it's just a part of our process. But she always gives me 110%. Mm. She's super ambitious. Those dynamics and relationships push me to be better. And I like having a space for people where they can do that. They can be themselves. You know, I think everyone that I get, you know, that I'm lucky enough to work with and that comes through my doors or reaches out to me online, like they are my inspiration. Mm. And I don't think they see that sometimes. Like th those are the people driving me to be better. The reason I push so hard as an athlete is because I owe it to them to lead the way. Mm. I have a responsibility to show them this is how we should do this. This is how hard we should work. This is the shit that we go through. How am I going to turn to someone who's going through an injury and tell them how to come back if I've never been there? Mm. Now, I didn't get injured on purpose, <laughs> but now I have some context yeah. and I, I can relate. So when they're going through stuff, I'm like, this is the mindset you need to have. I can now help them better. So the further I push myself, the more I can help those people. Yeah. And that's, that's ultimately what drives me on, man. You know, it's like, I, I need a really big goal to keep me at it for a long time, which is that 990 or that 10 times body weight total, whatever comes. And whether I ever achieve it or not is not the point. The point is I need something to drive towards. Mm. And so does everyone else. And like I said, I'll bring it back to the, the series again. The divisions having divisions, being able to go from D2 to D1, like what are we working towards? Sure, I have a, I have a girl competing um, tomorrow, Michaela Keating. Michaela joined my gym to do spin classes and then I kind of like tricked her into powerlifting. <laughs> <laughs> I just call it lady strength training. Yeah. They were powerlifting. They were running a powerlifting program. Yeah. Like that's what it was. It was just linear progression, strength-based training um, done in different phases where you're doing your building, your strength, and your peaking. Like, very, very simple version of, of our training. And she starts getting stronger and starts latching onto that a little bit more. And But her ultimate goal was just to lose some weight. But because of the dynamics of our sport, that happened as the byproduct. Mm. She weighed in at, like, she'll be raging. I think she rang me just before I came in here. She was 69.6. Well, she's down 10 kilos. Yeah, that's she phenomenal. wanted to be 69 because now she's like, the goal was 69 yeah. because that's the weight class, right? But she's, I met her. She must have been 80 something kilos. Yeah. She's going to kill you now for this. Assignment. She will. Yeah, she's <laughs> going to kill me. Um, but she, she's one of those people that is a good example of someone who, you know, wanted to just lose some weight. The weight came as a byproduct. No, she's a super driven and motivated powerlifter. Mm. And you take someone like Lauren, who goes up a weight class, you know, can show that it's okay to gain some weight. It doesn't, it's not all bad. Yeah. She can be that person that's like, so when you're trying to coach someone, you're like, you'd get a little bit further and you'd be a little bit more motivated if you just gained two kilos. Mm. Oh my God, you got to be joking. Two kilos? Yuck. <laughs> like, relax. Right? And then you can take someone like a Lauren who's like, she's now my example for that person that I'm trying to have that conversation with. Like, look. Yeah. Her she body comp great. Her body composition's improved. You see her on social media killing it. Mm. You know, like, it's not scary. Yeah. I understand your doubt and I understand your concerns. You know, but give it a go. Trust me, no one, this is the empathy side. No one wants to see you achieve your goals more than me. Mm. You just have to sometimes trust me because a lot of people are preconditioned to think that yeah. we can't do this, we can't do that. I'm like, just trust me. And when you establish those relationships with people and you build that trust, you can get you can get a lot more from them. Trust is you know? the biggest piece. Absolutely. I, com I completely agree there. I've had it throughout my time as a coach. I had a, I've mentioned it before, I had a lady who had negative experience with a previous trainer, refused to deadlift. So it's going to fuck up my back. I don't want to do this. So I was like, no problem. Because don't, don't worry about it. We won't touch deadlifts. We'll train your upper back in loads of other ways. Don't need to worry about your deadlifts. And it was over the course of maybe two or three months. She'll, maybe I'll do deadlifts with you. Because yeah. we built trust. Because the pressure was off, she allowed the process to happen. We communicated clearly. And that sounds like pretty much exactly what your approach is. It's, Trust the process, trust that I know what I'm doing and trust that I've got the best intentions from you. But one thing you did mention, you've mentioned it a few times, is, and I love that you mention it, is that you recognize the value of your support network mm -hmm. because no one, and I mean no one who's a high achiever, does it simply alone. Like you might be the figurehead, you might be the spearhead, but there's all this behind you. There's all these people that insulate you and keep you on course in the same way you help the likes of Lauren or Jane or Darren or Katie 
there's this core group of people and I know because every time Urban Barbell rolls up, there's a crew. And yeah. everyone does everyone does their bit and everyone supports each other and I love that. Uh, you mentioned with Lauren as well and how Lauren obviously trusts you to go up a weight class. She looks great. She's, she does kill it on social media and I will say that as well. What a great way to get more eyes on the sport. She's great Absolutely. optics for the sport. She's a sponsored athlete with concept. She, uh, she competes to a great standard and she looks great doing it and I think that is exactly the type of optics we need for a sport like Paris to show that while we do have Jake Brennan's and Eamon Hartford's and Jesse Moran's and Luke Tolman's and Laura Vogelsang's. We've also got like Jane, we've got Lauren, we've got Darren, you know, we've got... got listers, you've got these, you've got, we have some characters that we need to lean into more. Yes. You know, it's just about leaning in more into them. Mm. You know, I think everybody gets behind them and, you know, they've got good followings, but I think it's important we we recognize what that what that is yeah. and how it can grow this thing. Yeah. You know, how we can get more eyes on our product, which is powerlifting. How are we going to grow it? And obviously to grow it, like if we're going to grow it and be able to commit ourselves fully to it, we have to have to monetize in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? All right. We build better merch, mm. right? Nice right. t nice jumper, by the way. Man, I'm looking fresh. I must get one of those. I know. Wait till the YouTube <laughs> episode comes out now and they'll all see what we're talking about. Um, Link in the bio. So it's like, all right, great. Maybe don't keep it so in-house. Um, me and Garben met recently. We had an opportunity to sit down and hash things out over nationals. Me and Gar have always been on pretty good terms, but we've never like tried to establish a good friendship. Like, why aren't we doing that? So we sat down, we spoke about it for hours at Deeran's house <laughs> so after nationals. And we we both shared the exact same views on a lot of this stuff. It's like, well, why can't people in my gym wear a City Gym t-shirt? Why can't people in City Gym wear Urban Barbell? Well, maybe if we just make the merch more user-friendly and the optics of it, if people see us collaborate a bit more, that will help. Like, let's grow this thing yeah. and not just grow the in-house. Like, let's all work together a bit more because we can lead this thing and make it bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have a responsibility to this thing that's looked after us to look after it now and pave the way for the next generation. I completely it. agree. I don't think... Especially on our level, powerlift needs to be us versus them. No. We're all Team Ireland at the end of the day. Exactly. And even more niche than that, everywhere in the world, powerlifting is still this very small sport off to the side. We can all work together to yep. make it better. I don't think I don't see any reason powerlifting couldn't be what CrossFit became. I think we oh, could hundred percent. I think we have the access, the availability, the barrier to entry is non existent, and we've got we have the characters, you know what I mean? I think what really helped CrossFit was they had, they really dialed in on people like Tia Claire Toomey and Matt Fraser. And since then, people have gotten more into the characters, more yep. into who the people are, and that's what gets people in. And I completely agree with you. The guys at City Gym, legends. Absolutely. Uh, like, gentlemen. So I see no reason why we can't have, and I've seen, I've seen it on Instagram, it was, it was very cool, you know what I mean? Like, I like that we have an environment where you can get a lift off from Jack Kenny or you can get backspotted by Jack Thornton or, you yeah. know, you can, uh, you know, cheer on Alex Kremens while he max a deadlift. Like, yeah, I love like, that. We're, we're like, we're actually, these are some of my closest friends in the sport. Yeah. You know, are these guys. And it just, I think we just should do, we all should do a better job of leading the way for everyone else. You know, there's other people are going to come through this world. I don't care who trains your place. I want to cheer for them. Yeah. And I want them to feel like if they make some other friends in the sport, they can train in my facility and vice versa. Mm. This isn't, you know, this isn't about creating rivalries, having the affiliation with abs because Jay is like a mentor to me in the sport. Mm. You know, like I want to be involved in this thing and help grow it. I want to, it's, it's helped me. I now want to help it. You know, I, th I think just optically, it's important that everyone stands side by side with it. Mm. Like I said, it, I know things are a little bit iffy at the moment, like the, the water is very kind of muddy and murky and we're not sure what the landscape of, you know, Irish powerlifting looks like in the next year or so, mm. but that will hash itself out yeah. and we'll figure it out. But, you know, I think, it, I think it's important that everybody stand together on it because we are that one team Ireland. Yes. And if we're going to make it work, we need clear, open channels of communication and it, we all have to support each other internally. And I think we do that for the most part. I think it, I think it's been very, very good. I think, you know, nationals this year was incredible. A lot of the, the coaches from other clubs, we all got to to speak a lot more than we typically would. And 
you know, I get to, I got to chat with Adam from Odyssey for a bit and yeah. we had crossed paths multiple times. We never got a chance to really chop it up and say, hey, it's really great to actually formally meet you. You know, I think, I think these things are very, very important. I think if we're going to grow the thing, I think small things that we've been chatting about, um, myself and Tracy Kelly had spoken about it. When Nationals rolls around or any comp rolls around, I can't remember if this came up with the AGM or not. Shouldn't all clubs have a stand at this if they're allowed to? Mm-hmm. Shouldn't we like all try and grow the thing? And shouldn't maybe all the clubs kick some of that percentage to the Fed to mm. grow it? Like there's other ways we can approach Like we're all, like every club owner is a businessman at the end of the day. 100%. Maybe we should all try and grow it together and figure out a way to do that. Say, hey, you can have a stand for X amount. And you can sell your merch at this comp. Yeah. Great. Your club makes money, gets some more exposure because you got to sell some merch. Fed got some extra money because you paid to rent a stand for the weekend. Like there's there's other things we can do to to grow it. I love the way you think. Yeah, I think it's important, man. I think, um, and then everyone will want to wear each other's shit. Yeah. Because like there's some of that new City Gym stuff is fresh. It is fresh, yeah. There's one of my, one of the kids in my gym, Kyron, he's one of our coaches. Yeah. He got I know, one. Man. So Kai gets one. Comes in, I'm like, it is cool. The VCR t-shirt? Yeah. It's sick, yeah. This is what stemmed on the conversation me and Gar. Yeah. He was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, you know you can't wear it here, right? <laughs> he's like, what you mean? And he's laughing. He thinks I'm joking. I'm like, no, for real. You don't go to Old Trafford wearing an Arsenal jersey. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> and then he was just kind of, he said to I was just like, I don't think I'm setting a very good example for him. Mm. So I was like, I had a chance. So at Nationals, me and Gar spoke. And I was like, that kind of stemmed on the whole conversation. And I'm like, let's just try and, you know, grow this together a little bit better. You know, let's let's see what we can do. We don't know what we're going to do in the short term, but in the long term, we're certainly all stronger together. 110%. Completely you know? agree. Especially, you mentioned Adam Phillips from Odyssey yeah. Strength. Adam, someone I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like nail down to. It's like he pressure him every couple of weeks. I'm like voice note on yeah, Instagram yeah. and all. But the guy lives in Bantry. Like, so, you know, it's, it's all timing. But uh, he has an expression I actually wanted to bring up earlier when you were talking about like coaching and the way you do it. His expression is, I, I, he might have, I'm not sure if he stole it from someone, but I love it. And I bring it up often because I t- he's the guy I know from. It's powerlifting is simple. People are complicated. Yeah. And I think that's particularly like everything you're talking about here about like, say everyone having a stand selling their merch, even advertising their club, right? And I can imagine like banners or flags of each place. Like, yeah. cause, like if you drive into the airport, you see all the different flags of all the different EU nations, whatever, something similar, like just with stands or banners or whatever. And it goes, and I think when you see them all side by side, one, it shows that there's a good amount of diversity, different approaches, but it's all united. You know, you've got Ab, City Gym, Phenom, yeah. uh, you've got Urban Barbell, you've got all, the, you've got Odyssey, you've got all these different people from all these different places but they're all coming together at this thing. And there's a lot mm-hmm. of intermingling, you know, like some of my favorite lifters, like I think Andrew Rowe from Odyssey is fantastic. Phenomenal uh, lifter. I think like Jesse Moran is, is one of my favorite lifters, man. I know he's not currently associated with any club, but like he's not, obviously he's going against a lot of my mates like Jake and I'm, fuck, what a I mean, guy. You can't deny him. Amazing. You know? But like just as a person, I, so there's so many guys that I love as lifters that I don't care about who they represent or what they represent. It's who they are. Yeah. Do you know what, man? Part of what you're saying is part of the reason I started this podcast. I had Connor Campbell, Odyssey coach on here recently enough. And same thing, we were discussing all this prior. It's all about like, I'm not, this is not strictly a powerlifting podcast. Like obviously a lot of the people I talk to are powerlifters, but it's, I think when you get into the meat and bones of who the person is, it stops becoming about whether they've got an abs crest or they've got an urban barbell crest or an Odyssey crest. Yeah. It's actually just a person that does a bit of lifting. Yeah. And I love that. Like, But I do love the way you think. I'm only going to ask you one more question because I've had you here a while and you need to go way in. <laughs> What's coming next for Ian Benson and Urban Barbell? What is next? Great question. Whatever you can reveal. Because I know, I know for the type of guy you are, you probably have a lot of things moving. But like, I know you've opened the new gym and the, the new goal with, the, with that before the end of the year, I'm sure, is to host a competition. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the next thing's kind of... What I have coming up on my professional schedule would be uh, 17th of April, I'm gone. I leave again for work um, as part of that film studio that I work for. So I will be gone for like six months. A little bit of back and forth here and there coming home to visit, but I'll ultimately be gone. So, so I got you just in time. Got me just in time. Yeah. So the goals in-house are to continue... We're gonna. We have junior nationals coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, we have some really, really promising up and coming lifters there. 
um, growing a junior team has been a big, big part of what we've been trying to do for the last couple of years. We're going to introduce a kind of junior academy. We're going to we're going to leverage in and lean into the business side of stuff that we know a little bit better from running fitness classes, and mm-hmm. we're going to try and run like group powerlifting training. We're going to in, try and get more people into the sport itself. Okay. Um, that's kind of like the the main goal at the moment is just get more eyes on the product. Um, we're going to continue to to leverage social media and try and grow that a little bit more. You know, that's why you see me vlogging. And, mm. you know, I, I'm personally really inconsistent with it. I do it because I enjoy documenting. Yeah. But I have like a bunch of footage that may never see the light of day, but I love doing it. So we're going to try and establish that a little bit more. Um, we have some interviews and stuff that we're going to do with our lifters and start putting more stuff out there. I would love to get into a more collaborative collaborative approach with other clubs and other lifters that are there. You know, things like this, for example, inviting people down. Mark Bell used to do it, mm-hmm. right? He'd go to super training, he'd bring in a lifter and he would interview that lifter and then maybe do a podcast with them. I, I would love to be collaborating more with people. That's my goal when I get back after. So I have six months away. In that, in that time period, we're going to grow things in the business internally where we're prepping for hopefully a comp at the end of the year, yep. all going well. Um, hosting our first ever comp, then going from that to kind of building in-house, growing this junior team and growing, you know, mo- just bringing more lifters into the sport. And then outside of that, man, it's going to be, you know, just really trying to collaborate more with more of the juggernauts of our sport. Mm-hmm. And just interesting characters in it and yeah then you know i'll see how how everything is looking i'm gonna try and drop some of this additional body weight while i'm away come back into that 90 to 95 kilo range and stay on you know stay on pursuit of my own goals um you know i would love to continue growing the junior team like i said getting more lifters to a national level and getting more lifters you know through the series and Ultimately, we'll see we'll see how that's going. But you know, we want to get more people into refereeing. Um, you know, we've got tomorrow. We have one of the platforms is entirely, or on Sunday, one of the platforms entirely Urban Barbell Crew. Wow. Uh, we ran a, a spotting and loading workshop internally last weekend for for people that are in house. You know, for one of those flights, it's an entirely an Urban Barbell Crew on the platform. That's something that I would love to bring in. Is that we look to host workshops on the line where we're doing spotting and loading workshops and getting more people volunteering in the sport. Uh, the sport lives and breathes by volunteers and, you know, being able to create something for those people to get more volunteers and so we can spot and load. Maybe getting members in who don't necessarily want to powerlift, but maybe they just want to be supportive of the club. Mm. Great. You ever thought about refereeing? You ever thought about spotting and loading? You, ever, you know, there's lots of things that you can do. I just want to get more people in the sport in whatever way possible and continue to grow it, whether that be from a volunteering standpoint or from developing more competitive athletes. Um, obviously my, my coaching goal is to continue to develop more competitive athletes and my external career from powerlifting and fitness is to continue pursuing that and, you know, maybe getting onto bigger and better productions. Now this is a pretty big production, but one day, you know, the goal is definitely to get onto something like a Marvel film or a Batman film. Amazing. Um, wow, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the overarching goal in that kind of field is Marvel. Definitely, definitely want to get into a Marvel movie, um, training some actors for that. So that um, is a absolutely stacked, stacked couple of months you've got coming up. Yeah, yeah, stacked. I'll be, I'll be pretty, I'll, I will be all in on the production. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, the TV show that I work on is called Foundation, sci-fi show with Apple TV. Um, I've been on that since season one. Uh, we're now coming into season three, so I travel with that. Um, and I get to work alongside some really, really cool cast members, um, some really well-known people that have done Marvel productions and have been in, you know, The Hobbit and things like that. I, I get to work with some really interesting people and that opened up a whole new world to me. Mm. Um, and that's, that, that's my own personal career goal. Like, I think when we get into personal training, right, if you're going to complete the game, surely that's one of them, mm. right? It's like, how far can you get in PT? If you're going to get into men's health, if you're going to get into film, if you're going to get into high level sports, you know, whether it's a football at its highest level, soccer, rugby, whatever, there's like certain avenues and I, I managed to find one of them and I got a very, very lucky opportunity and I want to pursue that. I want to pursue the fuck out of it. Like my long term goal in that in personal training is either I want to train the next James Bond or train the next Batman whenever that takes. 
maybe I'll get there before I total 900. Yeah. But, but this is it. You'd be the first like celebrity trainer with a 900 kilo total. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be sick, right? That'd be <laughs> sick. Like, what a um, resume. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a big dreamer. Um, but, you know, I, I always work towards it. All right, well, look, you know what? We drop it in right at the end. How about we get you back on when you're back? I would love that. Ian, Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Brother, absolutely. Thank you.